I have a question for you. Do you get caught up in the numbers? It could be followers or podcast downloads or even how many customers you have. It's okay. I'm pretty sure we all do it. A couple episodes ago, I spoke with Megan Kicks, and one of the things that came up was follower count. And she spoke about how we should maybe look at the depth of our connections as opposed to the numbers. And I agree with that. But what would it mean for your business if you had 10 million people following you? Last week, I spoke with John Cannell, whose new book, Preppy Kitchen Super Easy, was released this week. John's built an incredible following, over 2 million followers on Instagram and nearly 4 million subscribers on YouTube, just from sharing his passion for food and his approachable recipes. Now, I'm not promising you millions of followers like John, but today he shares what worked for him, and hopefully you can implement some of those strategies if you're looking to grow your audience as well. This is part two of my conversation with John Cannell. This is Chris Spear, and you're listening to Chefs Without Restaurants, the show where I speak with culinary entrepreneurs and people working in the food and beverage industry outside of a traditional restaurant setting. I have 32 years of working in kitchens, but not restaurants, and currently operate a personal chef service, throwing dinner parties in the Washington, D.C. area. In this second part of my conversation with John Cannell, a former middle school teacher turned full-time food content creator, we dive deep into the business side of food content creation. We talk about the importance of finding your own style, how to develop an authentic brand, and why proper lighting might just be the most critical element to your photo or video shoot. We also discuss the realities of balancing family life with the demands of being a full-time content creator. This is a shorter episode, but I think it packs a lot of punch. And if you missed part one of our conversation, it's linked in the show notes. It's not critical listening for this episode, but it does provide a lot of context. So if you're looking to grow your audience, or simply want some solid advice on upping your food videography game, this episode's for you. As always, thanks so much for listening, and have a great week. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the business of like the food content creation and branding and a food person being a food personality, if you will, because I have so many listeners and other former guests who are in that space. So what do you have for advice about someone looking to start that? We talk about advice for cooks, but what about advice for someone who's maybe someone like me, you know, like I work in the food business, I do a little because it's for my business, but what like taking it to the next level and creating videos and maybe even transitioning to full time. I know you had said just, you know, like, get out there and do it. Is that the best advice? Just start. That is like, that's the first step because you can't just keep thinking about it and fine tuning your plan. At some point you got to try it out to see if it works or not. You know, if you were just getting started, I would really practice with the iPhone or your camera or whatever you're using and familiarize with like, how can I light this to make it look beautiful? Because honestly, if you're talking about food content creation, one of the most difficult things is to light and style your food. It is an art. And you'll see a famous chef or food personality posting about dinner and it looks horrible because it's like a normal person iPhone photo, like in a dimly lit restaurant. And the expectation online is for things to look really like luscious, saturated and gorgeous. So, you know, I would go ahead and like try to get the visuals down. And you can have your own personality. It could be dark and moody. It could be clear daylight. It could be a beautiful afternoon, golden light. And you can create that in After Effects to a bit. But find your style, find what you like, and try and refine it. Because in this field, that's not easy to do. (laughs) I think lighting is tough, but we're at least in a a day and age where this that stuff has gotten less expensive right like it's not that expensive to get some decent lights at home or a tripod or something and most phones to be honest these days take pretty decent video it's just learning how to use them properly yeah and natural light is your friend find that beautiful kind of dark room with one window and perfect exposure that you can get that nice scrape of light coming across your food and making it look really beautiful now you clearly have your own aesthetic and style do you think you always have to kind of stick with that? Like, should you try and figure out early on, like what that aesthetic is and stay kind of in that lane? Do you see that as being really important as to kind of build your brand around that personality? I think you could change over time. Nothing should be set in stone, but find what you like, you know, that find what speaks to you and you change day by day, year by year. So Maybe you start off and everything is light and bright and very minimal and time changes and you want to have things be like darker and more saturated and much more cluttered and more lived in. 
as long as it's natural to you, I think, because there is the tendency sometimes to jump on trends and it's like, oh, this thing with this person's popular, let me do that. But it doesn't always come off as natural. A lot of food influencers who are very popular are really like, they're big personalities. Like they're loud and kind of, you know, I don't know. It's like they're extroverts. Yes, no. Boisterous. That is not me. I am someone who got had to be like (laughs) dragged in front of the camera, kicking and screaming. And like I speak on camera as though I'm in my classroom back when I was a teacher. And I'm just trying to like be helpful and kind and like we're all in this together. Let's make something happen. But I'm not going to try and be the big personality with a personality that's not mine because I wouldn't be authentic. I think that's what I really like about your content because it's what I'm drawn to. I don't really like the, I've got the black gloves on and I grab a 800 ounce piece of meat and I slam it on the counter. I can't watch a cooking video like that. Like I really want to get in there and learn how to cook and make a dish as opposed to these very quick cuts, just like in your face kind of shots. And some people love that. The thing you need to remember is like you are not going to be everything to everybody. There are different audiences and you can find your audience. Some audiences love the slowest, most intricate drip of information. It's relaxing. You respond to it. You learn from it. Some people like the exact opposite. It's a very staccato set of cuts. There's space for everyone in between. Find out what you like and try and make that happen. And a lot of these food influencers online do a lot of collaboration, but that doesn't seem to be your thing either. Have you done collaborations with other like people in that space or not at all? I've done some collaborations and they're fun, but I live on a remote farm in Connecticut. So (laughs) it's not the easiest thing for me to do. That's one of the reasons I actually liked the book tour so much, because when the first, first one happened... I had just been on the farm for like years at that point with an occasional like trip to go someplace. And I speak to people online, but I never got to meet them in person. And when we announced the tour dates, I was like, oh my gosh, is anyone going to come? Like, what if no one is there? I'll be so sad. And people did come. And it was lovely because I got to like physically, tangibly like shake hands, see them, hear stories. And like, you know, it was it was a really lovely time. I love meeting people. So I, yes, I would love to do collaborations. <laughs> answer your question. I just, it's hard to, to go places where people are. Yeah. I just wonder, are these people traveling or do they all live in like LA or New York? I think a lot of people live in big cities. Like if you yeah. live in LA, that's a huge center. If you live in New York, that's a huge center. There are some cities in the South as well, where there's a lot of like food content creation. But if you're not, you might just have to time a family trip or something and take a sidestep for the day to do a collab. Well, and being married and having kids, it's very different. I mean, I know a lot of these guys are younger and girls, you know, it's like if you're single and in your 20s, yeah, sure, you can hop on a plane or a car ride and drive from, you know, New York to Philly to do a collab. Not as easier when you've got like other stuff going on. Life is about compromise. Life is about trade-offs. So you have the joy of having these children and there's more responsibilities as well. The list goes on. For context, let's say you have like an eight minute finished YouTube video. Huh? How long was the actual shooting of that recipe? I mean, and it drastically changes, but hours, right? Like to get like eight minutes of finished footage. I'm assuming it's quite a long period of time. It is like it's going to be at least an hour. People are different, though, and some people shoot differently. Like I like to have two cameras running. So one is tripoded here and one is for me. So there's like a detail shot and something else that just requires like every time you change a setup, you're moving a camera and refocusing it and like making sure everything is still working. There's a lot of checks that happen, making sure the light still is nice. People will ask, how long did this recipe take? And I'm like, I have never made this recipe without filming it somewhere. So I don't know. It's always taking a long time. I made chocolate cupcakes from the book for a party we went to. Are those the dipped in ganache ones? Yeah. It took like 10 minutes to make the cupcakes. To make the batter. And I was like, this was so. I actually took some stories, but like that wasn't the same as like, you know, doing a, like, oftentimes when I'm making a recipe, I'm also testing it. So, you know, taking notes, what changed? What brands am I using for this? And like, you know, it has the, it's like an intense list. So it does take a long time to make an eight minute video. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And I'm someone who just talks off the cuff. You know, I can talk about food all day long and 
I have things to say that maybe some people want to listen to, but a lot of other creators work differently and they'll want to script things out and have things like intensely researched. Like my friend Max Miller, who has Tasting History, which is a fun channel that that's, melts history and food together. So many notes. And because he's talking about history, he really wants to bring a lot of things in. So there's so much more preparation that'll happen for a video like that. Like it'd be days of preparation and he'll only be able to put one up a month or something. What's your release cadence? Like how many videos are you getting out between regular, like long form, but also like short reels? Two long form videos per week and two short form videos per week. That's a decent amount. I mean, it's only four, but that's a lot when you're like doing videos. <laughs> I had three for a while, three long form videos, and that was too much. So we had to like just reel it back down to something that's more doable. Do you have people helping you with the filming or is this like you're a one man show? I have someone to help me with the filming and the long form videos are sent to an editor that just so everyone knows, like editing a long form video is very time consuming and requires you to be super hyper focused on what's happening. Like no one talks to you, no distractions because you need to be like in the flow. I used to do it at the very beginning. But I was very happy to pass it on. Um, I still edit the short form videos, which is um, much more doable, but also like very persnickety in a way. I edit all my podcasts. I've been doing this for five years and I've never outsourced any bit of that. So I know what that's like. And I've had the yeah. conversation with a lot of friends who also podcast about like, when's the time and if and should I uh, outsource any of that? But right now, you know, when we're done with this conversation... I'm going to be listening to it. I make all the cuts both on the technical end and, and just how I want to chop it up and remix it. It's nice to have that control. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's time. It's like time versus money, which is everything, right? Like where's my time spent? Yeah. Where's my money spent? Which speaking of, so do you think you need to hire if you're going to take this serious? Because I do have people who want this to be their business. I mean, I'm assuming to get to the point where it's like, you just have to be confident in what you're doing and just say like, yes, it's going to take a couple bucks and I'm going to have to pay for this help and just bite the bullet and, and go forward with that. I think in general, people are like one man bands for as long as they can be because it's not easy hiring somebody in like different ways. It's also a very specialized skill set you're asking for a lot of the time. But, you know, for the first few years, almost everyone I know worked on their own or like with their partner. So they like their husband was the cameraman. Like during COVID, my husband was the cameraman. <laughs> so <laughs> we would like be with the kids all day long. <laughs> they go down to sleep and we're like turn on the lights, like let's make a video. <laughs> so like that's, you know, for as long as possible, people will do it all themselves. And most food content creators wear so many different hats. They know how to do copywriting, food styling, food photography, editing, you know, videography, like the list goes on for all these things they can do, contract negotiations. And then once you get to a certain point, like then you feel like, okay, I feel like I can hire somebody and I'm not going to be really stressed out about this. This is going to be a help to me. I'll have more time for something that's that I can do better. Now, I will tell you, I don't know what their interest level is, but your kids are getting to the age where they can maybe help. My daughter did a video shoot with me last year when she was 10 and she actually held the phone and did a lot of the shooting for me we actually were shooting the new trailer for my personal chef business and we rented an airbnb i did eight dishes and we storyboarded out everything and she had a list of all the shots it's like i'm making this when the alcohol hits the pan and the flame goes up you need to get that shot because it's a one and done and do this and that. I did some of the food myself, but when I was in it, she shot it and she was 10. So your kids aren't that far off. I was so excited. I sent this to the family group chat, but Lachlan took a picture of me like holding a book because I needed it to post that day and like there was no one to help me. And he did such a good job. He was like on a little soapbox, like, Papa, should I be like this? He's seven. And I was like, oh my God, it was like such a good photo. I actually had a much better smile too because I was smiling at him. <laughs> so <laughs> they will be helping. They actually, they really love being in the kitchen, they always want to do things. It's for them, it's really fun. And, you know, I love it when it intersects like fun and helping me. So like, oh, what do you like to help with these snap peas? They all need to have their strings removed, like makes dinner go by easy. You're still here? The podcast's over. 
If you are indeed still here, thanks for taking the time to listen to the show. I'd love to direct you to one place, and that's chefswithoutrestaurants.org. From there, you'll be able to join our email newsletter, get connected in our free Facebook group, and join our personal chef, catering, and food truck database so I can help get you more job leads. And you'll also find a link to our sponsor page, where you'll find products and services I love. You pay nothing additional to use these links, but I may get a small commission, which helps keep the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast and organization running. You might even get a discount for using some of these links. As always, you can reach out to me on Instagram at Chefs Without Restaurants or send me an email at chefswithoutrestaurants at gmail.com. Thanks so much.